the Ordnance Department and the government had thought for a long time about the idea of interchangeable parts. The French armory system uh, that created the Charleville that I showed you earlier said that it was impossible, said that all the muskets had to be made by hand and that to achieve interchangeability would have been difficult. Well, the idea wasn't surpassed in, 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 for a while. And along comes a man from New England named John Hall, who says to the, the Ordnance Department and the government, you know, I've got a great idea. I think I can make you a product that will be made with interchangeable parts. And the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to make machines. We'll use this magnificent Shenandoah River out here, or the Potomac River perhaps, and, and we will uh, take the water power that we need and we'll drive wheels and we'll make the machines that it takes to produce the parts and pieces of the gun that I want to make. I'm going to hold up a, a John Hall piece for you. Now this piece is a little later. It is a, a, a percussion piece, not a flint piece, like the musket that I showed you. The original John Hall rifle was in flint. And the, the thing, it's very interesting to look at. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of these are going to wind up in both Union and Confederate hands, some of them undoubtedly walking around Jefferson County in the early years of the war. A few things that I want to discuss about the Hall. Uh, it is not a muzzle loader. John Hall designed a rifle so the principle of rifling and lands and grooves and shooting a tight fitting ball are still part of the piece. Hall decided he would create a breech loader. Uh, if you look, you'll notice that there's a block that has risen. And the idea here is that the soldier would take that same round, tear it, pour the powder down the hole, stuff it in the hole, with his finger put the ball in and close it. Well, that speeds things up considerably. In his landmark work, Hall's endless tweaking and trials led him to a historic conclusion. If you can harness water power, and you can direct the greatest amount of water power precisely to a manufacturing end, you can manufacture arms possessing a precision that achieves true interchangeability. He surveyed the Shenandoah River alongside his operation and its vast utility. In his machine shop, he created a hanging forest of pulleys looped with leather belts, all of which was attached to a shaft leading to water wheels, scooping up the river's water, capturing its might. He could capture more raw power by adding leather belts and widening them, increasing the belt's traction much in the way a modern-day automobile's wider and thicker tire can. So, when he was transmitting much great force through the leather belts and pulleys, the more substantial belts would also not stretch and wear out too quickly. He could reduce, that is, or generally regulate the power transmitted to the machine with similar substitutions. At the suggestion of examiners in 1826, Hall improved this power yield of his pulleys and the leather belts by balancing the wheels of the pulleys in a way much like today when lead weights are applied to the rim of a tire to balance it wrote his examiners in 1826. This is done by loading the light side of the pulley wheel with lead or any heavy substance till an equilibrium takes place, by which means there is the tendency in the revolutions, however rapid, to wear more on one side of their journals or gudgeons than on the other. General Wool of the Ordnance department reported that not only could the machine's moving parts operate well at 3,000 revolutions per minute, the speed could also be increased or reduced at will. The transmitted power was not wasted and was better directed to the specific manufacturing task. 
drop hammers in the die casting could deliver ten blows each second on a softened piece of iron. The increased water power was sent to these machines that were mounted on massive wooden frames. So great were the realized new levels of power that the machines vibrated or shook, making precision manufacture impossible. Hall took the next step. He contracted ironworks. In the mid-1820s, he sent drawings and patterns, among others, to the Antietam Ironworks on the Potomac River for heavy iron castings, carriages, and frames to stabilize his machines. The solidity, mass, and great weight of Hall's all-important metal-cutting or milling machines provided the stability during their operation, allowing the very rapidly spinning cutter to make clean and even deep cuts in the metal that met the extremely demanding standard for interchangeability. This capability allowed Hall to make cuts in the finer parts of his 1819 patent rifle that had 23 parts in just the lock. The gauges could be case hardened to protect their surfaces and edges. Wrote one Dr. William Roberts, his greatest achievement came when he machined parts to a tolerance of one thousandth of an inch, a feat never before accomplished. For this, he is widely credited for completing the foundation for the American Industrial Revolution. Hall had already concluded that to make 100,000 uniform rifles, as claimed to Calhoun, only a proper machine could make each part so consistently as was needed. Unfair, it also was, to dock a workman's pay the cost of a part each time he made a substandard one. Hall exhorted his gunsmiths, the men who could make a musket perfect unto itself in three months, redirecting them to create these machines to make. Machines that could produce perfectly all the parts of a rifle, in addition to machines needed to make the part-making machines. One source wrote, Hall developed and constructed drop hammers, stock-making machines, balanced pulleys, drilling machines, and special machines for straight cutting, lever cutting, and curve cutting. Hall's straight cutting machine was the forerunner of today's versatile milling machine and a critical tool used in the fabrication of precision metal firearm components. Most revolutionary was the ease of operation of Hall's machines. Activity was more necessary than judgment, and young boys or common hands could successfully run them. They both functioned without any manual guidance, but evidently ceased operation once the workpiece had been finished, allowing the worker to operate several at once. With the retirement of War Secretary Calhoun, Hall's local opponents stepped up their challenges demanding tests of Hall's breech-loading rifle in a practical examination. The soldiers who put this gun under test in Fort Monroe, Virginia, Fortress Monroe, had a trial there in the 1820s where they shot John Hall rifles and they also shot the Model 1814 Harper Sperry conventional rifle and some contract rifles and muskets. They were getting a good rate of fire, they were also getting accuracy because it is rifled. Uh, it's, it's a neat idea, it's just kind of a strange looking gun, you notice it's swollen on the sides. Uh, Hall designed that so that it would be able to put this uh, mechanism called the breech in place. Uh, when we talk about guns today, we often talk about receivers. Well, I will go out on a limb here and say this is one of the first <laughs> receivers because it receives powder and a ball. All right? It's not a true receiver in today's terms, but pretty darn close. Um, so the Hall rifle was novel.
Hall's rifles performed exceedingly well over five months of continuous use by soldiers in the field at Fortress Monroe, Virginia. The Hall rifle could fire 100 shots during the time, a common rifle fired only 43 rounds, and a musket 37. The examiners concluded that after 8,710 discharges, and when compared to the common rifle and a musket, Hall's rifle great and general superiority has been manifest. Wrote the Norfolk Herald, Mr. Hall, the inventor of the patent rifle which bears his name, is now at Fortress Monroe, attending a course of experiments which are making at the artillery school with this weapon. Those gentlemen who have witnessed the firings and the execution express themselves in terms highly favorable to the superior properties of these rifles. The Richmond compiler wrote, It loads near the butt end instead of at the muzzle. The patent rifle may be loaded and fired with good aim more than twice as quick as muskets. In short, they are very durable and combine every advantage peculiar to muskets with many other of those species of firearms. These guns are most excellently adapted for American militia. Hall's opponents turned on the scandalous waste of taxpayers' money by Hall's development of machines and tools to make the guns parts. And another committee was recruited to evaluate Hall's totally unique machine-based way of making guns. At the time, John Hall would have been viewed as a Yankee. And a Yankee coming to Virginia to build a Yankee product, oh my, the, the consternation that would cause over time. Uh, even more so are that the men who are working in the musket factory in Harpers Ferry producing uh, the muskets are doing it by hand. And John Hall comes with a set of ideas that says, no, I want to make machines that I can teach men how to, let's say, push a button, pull a lever, adjust the belt, and watch the machine do the work. You see, that takes the idea of handwork out of it. Uh, now, there had been other inventors, and specifically armorers, uh, uh, Simeon North, um, Eli Whitney, to be sure, who in this period had tried to take machinery and had tried to utilize it, and, and specifically Whitney, had tried to come up with an idea of interchangeability. Um, of course, we know Eli Whitney because of the cotton gin, but also we know Mr. Whitney because he had created some rifles and pistols. Um, he didn't quite get to the point where he needed to be with interchangeability. All that would change with John Hall, however, when, in, by 1826, his first piece, he's ready to have it tested. What Hall had wanted to do was to make a series of these and then put them in a pile in parts and pieces on the floor of his factory and uh, have inspectors come and reassemble, let's say, three of them uh, just from random parts of piles. Well, the thing that I want to mention that is important to Jefferson County history in this, this war era, or antebellum era, actually, is that the first person in history to achieve interchangeable parts made by a machine completely did it in Jefferson County. And he did it in the Hall Rifle Works on what is known as uh, Hall's Island or, or today Virginia's Island if you, if you are in Jefferson County. Um, Hall had uh, Mr. Sage, Mr. Carrington, and Mr. Bell come. They were a committee sent up. And these gentlemen took pieces and parts of his different rifles that had been disassembled, and they did reassemble the pieces on the floor, and they notified the Ordnance Department that, yes, indeed, John Hall has accomplished that thing which we wanted to do. The knowledgeable committee of James Carrington, Luther Sage, and Colonel James Bell, based on three weeks of inspecting Hall's operation in December 1826, published their report the following month. Historian Merritt Rowe Smith wrote, It is doubtful Hall himself could have composed a more laudatory document. 
The Carrington Threesome received about five dozen parts for each of the 100 Hall rifles, all mixed together. They were given 100 new stocks, recently delivered from Hall's Rifle Works, around which the men were able to easily assemble a functioning arm around its gun stock. Moreover, the many parts were left unmarked. As a result of this successful test, Hall received yet another government contract. Smith continued, Much of the excitement generated by the special investigation of 1826 can be traced directly to Hall's success in combining men, machines, and precision measurement methods into a practical system of production. In this sense, Hall's work represented an important extension of the Industrial Revolution in America, a mechanical synthesis so different in degree as to constitute a difference in kind. The Ordnance Department doubled Hall's salary to $1,450, increased his yearly production quota from 1000 to three, and continued his royalty of $1 on each finished arm. They were rewarding Hall above all for his improvements in the process especially for the use of certain milling type machines for cutting metallic substances that Hall patented the day before signing the contract. Colonel George Talcott of the Ordnance Department wrote in 1832 that Hall's manufactory has been carried to a greater degree of perfection as regards the quality of work and uniformity of parts than is to be found anywhere. Almost everything is performed by machinery, leaving very little dependent on manual labor, common hands. The next breakthrough would come shortly in 1834 when, using an exact copy of these priceless gauges, Simeon North, an inventor in Middletown, Connecticut, jointly produced with Hall, interchangeable rifles from his completely different worksite, proving the needed precision lay not in any man, but in the gauges entirely. One reason Hall's ideas spread so quickly was the Ordnance Department until the Civil War had the wise and novel stipulation in their lucrative contract that the contractor had to share all their innovations with the public and any interested party. Both Hall and Simeon North agreed to the terms. Lathe maker Thomas Blanchard refused. Those working under Hall were hired away and they spread the ideas on how to implement what the inquisitive and rattled British elite dubbed the American factory system. Well, that ushers in an entirely new era, and, I, and I'm, I'm taking the time to mention this to you because I want you to see how critical this is. Men are going to fight the Civil War with pieces like the one I first showed you, handmade muskets, flintlock muskets in 1861. If parts break, as I told you, there are no boxes of parts for them to reach into and replace broken pieces. They have to take the, the, the gun and they have to discard it, or they have to call for another gun. If they can pick one up or find it, it's an issue. What we're seeing with the John Hall rifle is what I would like to call a paradigm shift, because we've gone from a mechanized, I'm sorry, a non-mechanized made product to a product that is suddenly not only machine made, but a product that can have boxes of parts in the rear waiting, if needs be, for an ordnance sergeant to run back and go get the right piece if it fails. Or, you know, after the battle or what have you. They can be repaired on the battlefield. Hall achieved a great amount of fame in Harper's Ferry. As I, as I told you, he was a Yankee, <laughs> so he achieved a great deal of malice from uh, Superintendent Stubblefield and Armstead Beckham and some of the other armory officials at the time. Um, and John Hall originally came here with the idea of producing this product. 
as I, as I am showing you now, what would come about is a whole new system. Thank mm -hmm. you.